will under his will. But say, not what I want to do, but what you want to do. What you want me to do. What you want me to say. Whatever you have lined up for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so we continue to look at the Mashiach. When he was on the, on the tree. He said, not my will, but your will. So, so, so Laid and Avon is tied into each other. Your will and iniquity is tied into one another. So all it is is a question. Is that why? Hallelujah. 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 All right. Hallelujah. Can we, can we please right stand really quick? Please, 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 please. Just really quick. Really quick. No, it's, it's still. It's, we, we, we like honoring you. I mean, we, I, at least I do. We, we don't we, mind. We, we don't exactly. Mind. I mean, it's, it's two seconds we stand in the honor. Hallelujah. Why call it thou be good? There's no one good but the God. Hallelujah. We thank the Most High for our foray today. Excellent, yeah. excellent teacher. Hallelujah. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. The only man you reverence is the Most High. But I really Hallelujah. thank you so much. Um, I want to start off um, the Shabbat um, with sad news for those who um, may or may not know. Uh, Ak Amir, who is a member of Chosen Seed, uh, the that assembly line. Just last week, uh, when I logged off, uh, when we got home, I uh, went on social media and I saw social, um, I saw uh, Chosen Seed during their worship, and uh, he was leading worship. Um, sadly, uh, I believe on Sunday, Sunday night, uh, he's no longer with us. Uh, I'm reminded of, of death. The Mashiach promised us that many of us will see death. We come into the Hebrew awakening, and you think we are mortal. Mm -hmm. Captain Hebrew man, <laughs> my twirling tassels. <laughs> <laughs> but we think we are mortal. Reality is, it's appointed unto man wants to die. Then the very judgment. Yeah. Romans chapter 2 makes it very clear. The God hath no respect of person when it comes to to life and sin. And although we who are Israelites, we have an advantage over other nations simply because he gave us the oracles. Reality is we're going to die. Um, death is not what happens to life. It's what happens in life. And uh, so it's a young Ak and uh, he's no longer um, with us in terms of the physical. Um, I reminded of a story of I'm reminded of a story of a father and son riding in a car together. And a bee flew into the window. And the little boy got scared. Daddy, 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 a bee! Daddy, 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 a bee! And the daddy grabbed the bee with his bare hands. Shook the bee up. Let the bee sting him. And then released the bee back into the car. After a couple seconds, here's the bee. And the little boy, Daddy, 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 the bee again. He said, Son, don't you have to worry about the bee. Because the only thing it's doing is making noise. The only thing it can do is intimidate you, but it cannot harm you. Because the stinger is in my hand. Abba Father, I took the sting out of death. Only thing that death can do to the Israelite, to those who are keeping the commandments, is intimidate you. But Abba Father, Abba Yah, have taken the steam out of death. Death, where is your steam? Oh, grave, where is your victory? So our thoughts and prayers go to Akamir. And it is a constant reminder for me and you. For us to embrace
Embrace. <laughs> Fact that you're not going to live ever. We're going to have to face our mortality. That's why keeping the laws, statutes, and commandments Hallelujah. such a vital necessity. Yeah. Yeah. The Apostle James said, Life is like a vapor. Just like that. Okay. Time and chance happened to us all. But to the Israelite, <laughs> there's no fear to die. When you keep the laws, statutes, and commandments, yeah. we just sleep that long sleep. Yeah. So to Brother Amir, we'll see you during the resurrection. And the dead in the Mashiach survives first. Yeah. Those of yeah. us who remain, we're going to be caught up with him yeah. in the air. The hostile times of raging war against the commandment keepers. In fact, if you look in the eschatological book of Revelation, the scripture says that we come to make war, the dragon, with the commandment keepers. How many of y'all keeping the commandments? That's right. That's why the enemy is like a, a marksman, skilled marksman shooter. You know, you're a bullseye. You think you went through trouble? You think you went through opposition? You think you went through tumultuous activity? When you were in Christianity? When you come into the truth, you are his biggest threat. But it's something about keeping Torah that's your rear guard. The scripture says your rear reward, which means Yah got your back. A thousand will fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. But it should not come nigh thee. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. When we keep this law, we cannot stop death. Death is inevitable. It's a point out to man wants to die. Didn't it? But we got, we, here's what Shahu said, we don't die and grieve like individuals who have no hope. Our hope is that we're going to spend eternity with the Mashiach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of y'all you may die in this life, but you can die again. How can you die again? What's going to happen after this age? What are we going to? No, no, say it again. The millennial. Can you die again too? Is everybody going to make it? No. no. Everybody going to make it? So that's why the scripture says, let no man judge you concerning the Sabbaths, and the feasts, or the festivals, and the new moons. But they are a shadow of things to come. When we get into the thousand year reign, we still got to keep the Sabbath. We still got to keep the commandments. And if you don't, your demise is inevitable. So we pray. The family of our Amir, wonderful worshiper. Someone said it best. He made hard thug bruise one worship. <laughs> Worshiping in, in Timberlands. Yep. <laughs> Only what we do for the most high will last. Yes. What a way to go. Yes. What a way to go. Let's thank Yah for the life and the legacy. I want you to put up that one term. I, you all are given to intellectual capacity. You all are Hebrews. You all know the script. Go back to Hebrew. Yeah, perfect. What is this? Anybody? The name of who? The name of who? Yahuwah. Or Yahuwah. Uh, Yahawah. Uh, many people say, and I'll explain to you why they get Yahawah versus Yahuwah. So this is Yahuwah. All right. So what are the paleo letters? You all want to cut the light dim the line a little bit? This one line so you can see. Thank you. 
Not W, you see that one? Okay, that's better? Yes. All right, so what is this here? What is this? So? Yo, hey, Bob, hey. So, go to next one, Sam. So, we know, continue. So, Yahoo and Paleo. So, Yod He Lot He. What do that mean? What is Yod? The work of the hand? Arm. Or the nose, what? Or strength. Right? Arm or strength. But notice it's hay. It's hay. What is hay? Reveal, reveal, revelation. Now, let me give you a little secret here. Whenever you see hay in front of a letter or a word, it is ha, H A, ha, right? Like ha mashiach, ha kodesh, ha satan, ha satan, ha it means the, right? Ha, right? And then reveal something. It's ha. However, when it's after a consonant, what sound will it make? Ah. ah. Not ha. Let's flip the letters. It's ah. So what is the name, the shortenized name of the father? Yeah. Yeah. Yod and ah. Ha. Right? Hallelujah. Yah. Right? So does yah. So whenever you see hey, um, it, when it's in the front, it's the ha. That's where we get the term, um, we get man and behold. However, when we see it after a consonant, we get the word ah, or the pronunciation ah. Now, ah doesn't necessarily mean man or behold. Here's what it means. You ready? Yes. Want to hear? Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> it means life or breath. So the fact that you're saying Yah, it means breath or life, all right? So this is life, right, or breath, because it's after a constant, right? So that's Yah. So when you say Yah, you mean you're saying the one who is the strength of my life, the source of life, the beginning of life. That's Yah. It is a timeless name. It is Yah. Then Bob, of course, is nail or attachment to A. And then, of course, we get hey. Again, it is life or breath. It's not behold or man because it's not in the front. It's not, it doesn't leave a word. It's somehow after a consonant. So that means his name means Yah added nail or he added the breath of life. Psalm Division 133 says that he have created the inhabitants of the earth by the breath, breath of his mouth. By the breath of his mouth. So Yahuwah means the breath of life. When you say, everybody just say, let's breathe. Breathe out. We can use tic tac later. A little louder. A little louder. So even in your breathing patterns, you're saying, yeah. 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 that everything that has, yeah. that everything that has, yeah. Yeah. now, at some point next week, we'll get into what we call the diphthongs. Diphthongs are important because diphthongs, many people use it, diphthongs, um, diphthongs is where many people say that it was Greek influence. So that's how where they get what we call Kodesh Lashawan or Lashawan Kodesh, which means holy language. So they only use Yahawa, Yahawashai, uh, only use um, uh, various things, only with uh, the A is represented. There is no diphthongs or the long vowel songs like ooh or ooh, right? And so, like you get in Hallelujah. However, 
So you gotta look, whenever you talk about Yahuwah, whenever you have, um, whenever you is after ah, or is in between two hays or ahs, there is this long diphthong, which is ooh. So it's not bob or bob, it's ooh, ooh, Yahuwah. Yah, right? A H Y A H Yah. Ooh, uh, because you have the two va or the va is really a ooh sound. And I don't have time to get into that in detail because it's a different teaching and it takes some time to break down. Um, however, we see it as we see in the what is the ancient name for Judah? What? Yah what? Yahuda. So you got the ooh in there again. Yahuda. 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 Now, many people will say, well, you know, uh, that's influenced by the Greeks. And the Greeks did that long before the Greeks were even a, a people. People in Africa have always had the ooh in their sound. It's not a Greek invention. To this day, Bantu's language is the oldest language known to man. And they still got ooh in their sound. Egyptian language, it predates many of these, and they still have diphthongs. So that's neither here nor there. I have a, I, I deeply respect Rashawan Kodesh, right? So I deeply respect that. So if you want to say Yahawah and all that, that's fine. Shalom, you want to say that's fine, right? But we must understand that diphthongs is not a Greek thing. We have always used diphthongs. Diphthongs is whenever two vowels are together, like two O's. It's called dip thumbs. Dip thumbs. All right. So, Yah added, so Yahuwah name means what? So, your assignment, your homework for this week is that you will put in your mouth the true name of the Most High. And you will say Yahuwah. Yes. Instead of saying God, instead of saying uh, any other name or even Elohim, and we are all the thing. Yahuwah. And see what he, what he do for you this week. Yeah. And so try this that week this week and replace it with all the other, you know, uh descriptive titles that we use and just use Yahuwah. Even the most high. I appreciate the most high. And at some point when the camera's off, we'll talk about why the most high is there in conjunction to El Elyon, El Shaddai. And other names, all right? So this is a whole different dynamic. Enotheism. Enotheism. And our ancestors were they were dibbling and dabbling in a whole bunch of things. Right? So there's a reason why yeah. the Tanakh speaks in a way it does. Alright, what's the next one, Sam? What is this here? Y'all ready now? What's that? Who? Yeah. Right. Yahusha or Yahusha? You sure? You sure? That's the name. Is that Jesus? Let's see. Thank you, Jesus. 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 No, go back, Sam. I'm getting no, no, no. Go back. There we go. What is the first one? Yo. What's the second one? Hey. Wait a minute. Is that similar to anything? Yahuwah. Just like you are. He said, I have come with the Father's name in my name, and you receive me not. But another is going to come in their name, and you shall receive me. Uh -huh. right. So we do see the Father's name in his name, don't we? Yes. Is the Father name in Jesus? No, no, it's not. But it works for people, right? right? So we got Yahoo, and then what is the what is the Shin? Shin we get the sh, and then we got I am. Wait a minute, isn't that Yahawashai? Wow. She tell the trick. Isn't that Yahawashai? This is why many people get Yahawashai. Because the I am at the end is say Yahawashai or the I afterwards. Mm -hmm. However, there is what's what we call some house rules in terms of Hebrew. All right. And so you, there's there's no that the I in is not an I when it's at the end of, a, of any uh, 
any uh, any work. But let's go there as well. So what do you mean again? R. Right. For life, right? Because it's after. Right? And then we have what? Nail. Nail. And then we have what? To destroy. To destroy. Or death. And then we have what? Which means what? Which means what? Now, over there. When we go back to Yahuwah, he said that his name will be known among all the nations. How is his name? Do all the nations call on the name of Yahuwah? No. Yes or no? no? Do they call on the name of Yahuwah? No. What did he mean by that? Go back to Yahuwah. Sam, how do they see the Father's name? Right, let's go backwards. All right? Let's go backwards. So, so we got uh, your Hey, ba, hey. Behold, what? Right? I'm sorry, sorry, behold. Behold. Hand. Behold. Behold. Now, we read that what? Backwards. Because most languages. Most Gentile languages, do they read from right to left or left to right? Left to right. right. They read from left to right. So from left to right, but we read from what? Right to right. left. Right. Right to left. Right. So we know it as yod hey vav hey. All right. However, they know it as hey vav hey yo, which is behold hand, behold nail, or behold nail, behold hand. So they know them through what? Through the son and the death of the son. The father said they were going to know my name. In other words, his name is descriptive when we look at Paleo Hebrew. All right, back. Let's go back to. Okay, yeah. So behold, nail, behold, hand. The toe is piercing. He said he would be known a light unto the Gentiles. And so when we read it from right to left, uh, most nations read from right to left. We get behold, hand, behold, nail. All right. Go back to what we're at. No, no, no. Don't give it away, Sam. Don't give it away. No, don't give it away. You gave it away. All right. It's too late. He gave it away. All right. So, you'll be what? It's all right, Sam. There's grace. Torah tor is about mercy and grace. All right. All right. So, you'll be what? Strength. Arm. Or, or strength. A means what? Life. 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 Life means what? Nail. 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 Shin means what? Yeah. Death yeah. or destruction. And I am means what? See. Let's see if we can see. Because this name should somehow, we should begin to see the characteristics. We should be able to begin to see the plight. We should begin to see the purpose and the objective of the Mashiach just through his name. So we got I N, which means what? And she yeah. means what? Yeah. Wait a minute. He's going to see what? Yeah. 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 Uh, what? Yeah. In his what? Yeah. Through his what? Yeah. Now, now, also, when we look at and we interpret it, though, so, although it's after a concept, when we go backwards, now it's after a ba, uh, 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 a ba, all right? Um, and so when we look at that, this is kind of ba, the only ba that's being used in, 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 in Hebrew. But after that, and only when it's followed a consonant, when it's a uh, ah, or life or breath. But then it flipped back and it's after a ba. So what do we get now? Behold, behold also means what? What is this person? A man. And what? Man. man. All right? So let's go to the next one, Sam. Let's see it all plays out. Let's see how it plays out. All right? So hand, light, nail, and shin, assume. All right, go. So, in other words, his eye, which is I-N, shall see death by nail 
by men his own hand. So he saw or foretold his death by nails in his hand will be caused by man. It's built in his name. In fact, if we go even farther, go to the next one. This term, Shin, also means where we get Shamayim from. What's Shamayim? It means an opening. It means an opening or it means deliverance. So when we add that into it, it has a different meaning. Go to the next one. Right. In other words, his eye shall see death, and it shall be an opening to heaven by a nail by men of his own hand. In other words, the scripture said there's no other name given under whereby there's no other name given under under the opening whereby man should be saved. Now, I'll stop there, but Hamashiach, or Hamashiach, Yahusha Hamashiach, or Hamashiach. When you break down Mashiach, folks, what you're really saying is that there is a continuous way out, because you've got a continuous way out through the arm or the strength of my brother. What does that have to do with the Mashiach? There's going to be a continuous way out. Deliverance comes through the arm of my brother. That's why you get ak, right? Mashi ak at the end. Wow. Ak. Ak, right? We say, oh, it's an ak. <laughs> but mashi ak means he's our older what? Brother. brother. <laughs> so our deliverance come through our oldest brother. So even we say aki, aki. Aki is, Ak is what? Aleph, and then Chet, and then what? Yo. Yo. So, so, so Ak means strength, Chet means a fence or a wall, and Yo means arm. So when you call somebody your Aki or your Ak, that means they got the strength to pull you over the wall. You are your brother's keeper. So in your, your language, language is not just a tool for communication, folks, but it also is a vehicle for culture. To, to throw away and do away with this language, then we will misconstrue and we will always convolute the scriptures. But when you understand the scriptures from a Paleo-Hebrew standpoint, you understand the revelation of it, right? You understand the deafness of it, all right? So you got it there. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! All right, come on, I keep um, we're going to call this segment really quickly. We're going to try to do this very quickly. Uh, we call this the uh, Awakening Israel, How I Woke Up. And we won't use chairs, so we will keep it to a five-minute minimum. But the scripture says we have overcame uh, Satan with the words of uh, our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So we got African-American so-called Hebrews all over that are waking up every day. We are coming out of the Christianity. We're returning back to the laws, statutes, commandments, and the ordinance of the Most High. We are keeping the feast. We are keeping Sabbath. Uh, we are, uh, many are, are wearing uh, Hebrew ancient regalia. Uh, they're wearing tassels. They're wearing fringes. Um, we see a whole cultural shift happening among African Americans. More and more African Americans are being faithful to the scriptures. We are scrutinizing the scriptures, we are looking at the scriptures, and we are now looking through the scriptures, or looking at the scriptures through a different lens. And so the awakening is happening, folks. It's happening on college campuses, it's happening in churches, it's happening in communities, it's happening in prison systems. The Most High is waking our people up. Now, we watch a trend that's happening. Um, I'm an analytical type of person, so I watch analytics. Um, and analytical data is very important to me in terms of analytics. And um, one of the things we notice with the awakening, what group do you think is waking up more than any other group? What demographic, what, what segment of the population is, is waking up more so than anyone else? Say it again. Say it again. Say it loud. <laughs> Middle-aged women are waking up. Now, 10 years ago, 
seven years ago, it was mostly young millennial and centennial young men who were the camps were they were drawn to the camp by droves. Um, they were standing on street corners, and I mean, no, they did their part. Yeah. They did their part. Their doctrine is off a little bit. A lot of their hate, a lot of their cultish ways, but they were able to do their part. So the awakening has occurred by Yah using them. It, it, it was going to happen from within a church. It right. needed a spark. Yeah. Yah had to do it from outside of mm -hmm. the ecclesiastical structures in order to wake people up. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So he had to do that. Um, but now we see the tree. We see it in the Hebrew Academy. Mm -hmm. We see it through the Great Awakening. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, the, what, the, the number one um, segment of the population that's waking up is middle-aged women. Mm -hmm. These middle-aged women are not women who never knew the Most High. They're not people who were unchurched. These women were vested in the church 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, and it only made, it's only fitting that that would happen. Yeah. Because women have always had this, this spiritual intuitiveness. They have always had this innate, um, instinctive ability to hear from Yah quicker than me. Mm -hmm. Thus, we see that the church is really a microcosm of that. Women tend to be more spiritual than men because men have lost their footing and lost their position right, in terms of hearing from the Most High. Um, but we find that's happening. I mean, where middle-aged women are waking up by the droves. Right? And they are leading kind of this awakening here. Um, I would say at the rate now, it's probably about 42% of the awakening is happening among middle-aged women. So then you see how the Ruach and the Holy Spirit is working in terms of waking up our people. Yeah. Um, but obviously, we don't have a middle-aged woman woman today that we're going to interview. Uh, we have someone. Uh, we have someone who's really dear and near to me. He's kind of like a spark plug, so to speak. A spark plug kind of gets the engine going. And Newbury, we really haven't experienced uh, the growth and the rapid increase until uh, he came and uh, he told me he said, "You're going to grow." He said, "What you are teaching and doing may grow." And certainly. We judge a person based on Deuteronomy chapter 13. We judge them based on their actions and their words, rather. And everything he has said has been true thus far. Uh, he leads our ox, our, our men ministry here. He also is the manager of our health, uh, our health uh, ministry. So he does that. He does a plethora of things. When you see him on the camera, he can do a lot of other things. You see him. He's a stickler. He's fastidious. It will be fastidious about about our culture and and garments and the big garment, etc. Um, and so we just want our brother, uh, who his government name is Jerome Whitworth, um, but his surname is Bezalel. Bezalel means a servant of the Most High, and we see Bezalel in the days of Moshe, don't we? And he's a servant. He means order. So if you ever look at Bezalel in the scripture, it means a man of order. And so we are happy. Why don't you all please help us praise the Most High for Brother Hallelujah. Ah, Hallelujah. 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 So, so Bezalel, you, um, obviously, you started off in the Christian church. Right? Uh, yes. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, that happened around 2007. Okay. And to make a long story short, um, I was living in Waterford at the time. And I remember not knowing no scripture. I had the mic. You see, no? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I was living in Waterford at the time. And to be honest, I was going to church looking for women. Let's keep it real. And I asked the father if he would give me this car, I would look for a church home. So I prayed for a car. He gave me the car. And did I look for a church home? No. I was in Chicago at the Blues Fest and all that. My car got towed up down there to catch the um, Greyhound back home. But a long story short, um, while I was there, and I had enough money to buy another car. And I bought a minivan. And my sister was at a church, and she asked me, uh, can, she, can I come to her church? 
to bring some toys they'll get away for the kids. I said, sure, you know, we live in Hondo. And so I sat in the very back row. Didn't want to be seen or nothing. And as I'm sitting there, the minister started ministering to me. It was like, you know, the, um, he said, um, you know, we gotta be careful with our tongue because we can kill people out with knives and double with our tongue. And I was like, man, because I was like tearing my nephews up, God, you're this wrong, you ain't doing it this way, you know, stupid me and all this. Right. And so the service went on and on and on. And he had an altar call. Of course, I didn't go up there. You know, I ain't going up there. So I sent it back again. And he got down there by me. And he looked at me. And he said, Come here, son. And I just started crying. I ain't never cried like this in my life. I started crying. The whole church started crying. He just gave me the mic. I was like, Here. Yeah, you know what you got to do. I was like, How would he not know you know that? So I had to apologize to my nephew. He was right there on the spot. And everybody. And that's when it began for me. And after that, I worked with a co-worker up in Flint, and he was into the Bible and everything. I wasn't. So after that happened, I said, man, you got to come see this man. You know, I told him this. And, um, he said, yeah, but I'm in Flint. And he go to Most High. So the very next week, the pastor said, oh, we're going to Flint to um, you know, evangelize. I'm like, oh, this is on one point. So I told my friend, and we all came, and we met at the, um, the place where we were having the fellowship at. And Most High sent me right on the aisle seat. So I can see everything. And as he's going on, he, you know, praying for people over here, over here, over there. And he got to this woman, and she was a dark woman. I remember like it was yesterday. Called her up. And he asked her, like, who do you believe in? Who do you pray to? She wouldn't say nothing. Now she's standing right next to me. So I see everything she got on. And he was about from where I am to, to that wall. And what I seen this is no lie. He just pointed his finger at this lady, and a, a lightning bolt came out of his hand. Hit this woman, she flew back off her feet, and then in the house, she started squirming like a snake. Now, your body can't move that way. I mean, she was like, like a snake. I was like, man, one lady actually ran about the church. She probably still running the church. <laughs> 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 and so, when, uh, when, uh, there she go. That was all over. And I said, I had to go see her. And I said, I, and I walked up to her. I touched her, I said, I just wanted to see her. And she turned around. I was like, oh, she was like light skinned now. Wow. I mean, she was black at first, like darker than me. But when I touched her, she, like, she turned around and she was light skinned. I was like, oh. So to make sure I wouldn't see anything, we got back to the church the next week. Everybody said, did y'all see that? I said, yeah, that's all for one. So, long, another long story short, after that, actually, that guy, like, it's crazy with me. It's like wherever I go, it's like people put me in positions without even knowing what I can do. He made me an armor bearer off rip. Wow. wow. I don't know those He had me up on the thing with him. I'm like, what am I doing up here? Like, mm, but anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know nothing. So um, after that, I heard of a Detroit revival with um, Pastor Glenn Plummer. I was still in water at the time. Now, Dr. Ken talked about earlier how only 95% um, don't really hear from the Most High. But I believe I'm only on 5% to actually hear from him. So when I was in Waterford, I got about the revival. I heard about it. I was like, man. I heard the Most High say, go back to Detroit. I'm like, I'm done with Detroit. I'm like, I ain't going to come back. He said, no, go back to Detroit. You need it. And so proved that he was right. I packed up everything. I moved down to Detroit. And I had a godmother who said, I had a room waiting for you already. Didn't even know nothing, had a room with me. And as I left my apartment, I broke my lease and I had to pay nothing. So I got out the lease and I had to pay nothing. I said, okay, this is, this is my son. So I get there, I tell Pastor Plummer, I said, you might see me around here a little bit more. This is my first day there. Long story short, I was there for three years. You know, they, I was um, anointed head deacon over there, ordained deacon and everything. And I was one of the deacons that, so yeah, I know I didn't play. You know, gum chewing and hats all all that. I mean, <laughs> but, but there, um, I was put in every position from um, bus ministry to facility maintenance to everything. Everything but actually, you know, preaching, which I'm glad I did at that time. I didn't mess it all up. <laughs> but after that, um, I was here for like three years. 
And once I became a deacon, I seen how the other deacons were like, we were like fornicating everybody in the church. And I was like, well, I got to be the difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't be there. So I started reading. Let me tell you right now, if you're a Christian and you're watching, the cure for Christianity is actually reading the book. Read the book. <laughs> read it. Yeah. And I begin to read it, and I'm like, Hey, something wrong here. And I had a job at the time, it was a night job. And you know, the most time you do with people at certain times. Like me, you know me, like early in the morning, like two, three, four, five o'clock. So I got in my car, and the first thing he said, because in, you know, in church we were taught certain words and certain things. Like we were taught that um, church make called out lines. So the first word he had me look up was the word church. And as I'm sitting in the parking lot in my car, and I'm looking at the word church, and I'm like, first of all, it's a German word. I'm like, that, that, threw, that threw a ring right there. James. I'm like, what's like, Germany got to do with this? And it meant like circus, something like that. I'm like, okay, this ain't good. <laughs> he looked up more words, and as I began to look at these words, you know, I went back and told the, the preacher everything. Um, then he showed me all the. Um, um, my man named uh, Constantine Creed. Constantine Creed. I see. Yeah. So I went back and showed Dr. Plummer that, the other ministers. I said, we supposed to keep the Sabbath day. And they all pretty much stoned me, like, get, get out here with that. Blah, blah, blah. So I remember um, I'm still there. And I asked the Father, one thing I didn't want to do, I, I didn't want my answers to come from man. Right. I want all my answers to come from the most high. So I said, Yah. Show me who I am. What am I? Am I Baptist? What am I? I mean, I knew I wasn't what they said I was. So, another long story short, I was walking one day, and it was the twenty-first. Now they tell you read a proverb every day, whatever. So it's the twenty-first. I said, "The Most High." He probably said, "Now I never found this scripture." He didn't show me. He said, "Go to Proverbs twenty-one. Your answer is there." So I get there. I'm reading. I get to Proverbs twenty-one. I read on down, and I get to verse 16, and it says, The man that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. I left the church that day. Wow. And the very next week, people literally started dying in that church, like physically dying. And no long story short, so I said, Father, this may be a year ago later, I said, well, if the church is wrong, why do you send me there? Like me and you talking, I hear him clear today. He said, I sent you there to show you what not to do. Wow. So as he putting all this stuff in me, and you know, certain scriptures you being to show me, but they didn't come back to reverence until like maybe three years later when another guy showed me that we were Israel. And once I found out we were Israel, that was just it for me. And I just took off. And that's why I kind of wear it on my sleeve who I am, because I know what I've been through. I know what the world is about on oh, that yeah. side. You know, I've been to pagan church, and you know, I know it's all. I'm not a mean person. I'm just, mean I'm just ordinary, and I'm just passionate about what the Most High has shown yeah, me. Yeah. Like, some people might get mad because like, I can't really show them the way that they want me to show them, but you don't even show me to be, be you know, worn with a loud shout as a chauffeur. Yeah, yeah. So I can't be passive with it because your life is on the line. Come on. So after that, you know, my dress changed. I said, I'm not wearing no more European clothing. I started making my own clothes. No intent to sell anything. I just started, I want to be. I said, well, the moon, they can come in and wear that culture. Why can't I? You know, so I just started, you know, really digging into our culture. And it's just, let me see. I'm trying to put everything really close. It's just, um, then he led me to um, other groups like here in Detroit, um, the Joe C. They were called the True Seekers at one time. Yeah. It took me a while to get there because even Brandon tell you, Brandon came to my job one day, and the first person I am, I'm sitting there. The viewer is like, I'm gonna ask you, hey man, I'm gonna tell you, you know, this is who we are. So Brandon, he came to my job. He laughed about this every time, and I came to him. I said, man, you know you gonna be Israel, man? He's like, no, man, for real, for real. So I said, go here. He said, what you gonna do? You gonna, you gonna go here? I said, yeah, I'm like. How do you know? So I kept saying, he said, what, what you gonna go here now? So he was playing with me. So Brandon was already, you know, in the church. Right. So he was playing with me, like, right. you know, because I'm at work. I got my DVDs at work. I didn't care. I mean, people know who I am. I'm at work. So he kind of played with me. He was like, yeah, I'm just playing with you, man. So me and Brandon hooked up. That's why I got to the children's scene. 
And even at the chosen seed, no, I'm going to go back to the chosen seed. I was with, um, uh, I'm going to say it on there, I ain't scared. I was with the fake Jews. And they played me at uh, the house of Joseph. And I was there for like maybe a year. And this is a funny thing. As I'm there, they never read the book. The guy always came in with like trunk board stuff. Right? They never read the book. And I'm sitting there one day, and I'm reading, I'm like, I just shouting out, like, man, these black people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just shouting out. Like, How did I know that? I don't know. It's like, these are the dirtiest of black people here. So the most high took me out of that. It's like everywhere that I thought I was going to be, he said, no, that's not it. Like, oh. So that's why I've been moving a lot. People think, oh, you just church up. No, I ain't church up. I'm trying to find the truth. Right. Yeah. And so from there, I went to another Baptist, white Baptist church. Right. Oh, that wasn't it either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from there, I think I wandered really for like 40 days. Trying to figure out who am I? What am I to do? I'm like, I'm confused. Like, it's got to be something. So that's when a brother from other church, my brother Lamar Ivy, if you're watching, and I would always see him, like, random places. So the last time I saw him, he said, man, you up to church yet? I said, man, I just left the other day. And he was like, come up my house, I got something to show you. And I could have been like any other Christian. Oh, man, what you going to show me? Man, you ain't got to show me nothing. But no, I went over there. He said, man, we just lied to you. He said, Sunday is not the Sabbath. He took my finger, like he, like he was giving me fingerprints of it. Yeah, I took my finger, took me to Leviticus 23. And that's all it took for me, 10 minutes. And so from there, you know, I went to um, I still talking with the children see, you know, and, and everywhere I went, and I say this humbly, like even with the children see, when I first started going there, there was nobody doing videos. It was maybe 10, 12 people there. And everywhere I go, people just tend to follow. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm anybody. I don't want to be anybody. But um, I do know from a very like, now, as far as I remember, I was five years old. I was always seeing things in the spirit, man, even at five, six, seven years old. I was always able to see things before they happen. Mm -hmm. Even I got, I got a scratch on my arm right here, if I show you later that. I grew up on the West Side, 12th and Leslie. Because I said it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And so we used to play on the bridge. See, back then, when we were kids, we would play like, in the streets, like on the cross bridges. So it was a cross bridge that led from. I think I'm gonna say Glendale all the way over the Lodge Freeway to what they call now is um, the North End. And so we would swing over the things. And as I'm about to swing, I see a piece of glass like maybe 20 feet. And I was like, I bet not land on that glass. And as I'm swinging, and I get close to the glass, I fell and land right on the glass. Why don't you, why don't you share a little bit about when you talk about the paganism of Christianity that we have today? You are thankful that the Most High delivered you from. That obvious that's setting. Um, for those who might be listening, they may not be clear about paganism mm -hmm. uh, and syncretism and this mixture of various other uh, occultic practices along with the faith. Um, what are some of the uh, very, be very clear about what these pagan traditions are uh, in Christianity that goes against uh, the, the scriptures itself? Oh, man, where do I start? Um, you can start, I start with Easter. You know, Ishtar. You know, the, the, the one with the multi breasts and all this stuff and the diner of the eggs, you know, and it really represents child sacrifice. Yeah. You know, and from there, you can even go to even, even the Sunday worship. Everything is put on Sunday for a reason. The day of the sun, day souls. It's for a reason. You know, they changed it. Constantine, he wanted to keep Christianity, but they want to follow it under the Hebrew ways. And he did not all he done all these things to um, keep in rulership. So that's why he changed everything from the true Hebraic way of Shabbat and everything to Sunday. Because everything on Sunday, that's why Mother's Day and Father's Day. Now Mother's Day is really the worship of the Catholic Church, the mother church. You got nothing to do with your mother. And Father's Day is the worship of the Pope. So the Bible tells us clearly, don't call no man father. So what does Pope mean in Latin? It means father. Right. They don't call him father. 
the syllabus. I mean, I, I'm the girl. I can't talk about the pagans. In the in conclusion, why don't you share with someone who may be on the fence concerning the awakening? Uh, if they can maybe watch some caps and turn it off, but yet they know that what they the setting in Christianity may not be for them. So they got a foot in and a foot out. Why don't you share and give them some wisdom or just share with them in terms of your experience and give them some advice? The advice I would have to anyone that's teetering in Christianity or whether I should, you know, come up to the Hebrew or whatever is start by asking questions. Ask your pastor questions first. You're not going to tell you, but you have to ask them. And start reading, you know, and start, you know, start coming out of the house. Because one thing you have to do is you can't be on that side and do what I got. You got to cross over to look back at that side. And that's what I did. If I had never crossed over to look back over there, I'd probably still be over there. Right. So you have to come out, read, you got to read, I mean, research, research everything that you have learned in the past, everything. Pretty much unlearn everything you have. Give it up for Professor Lee. So if you are interested in sharing your story, uh, we want the scripture says we overcame Hasakan by the words of the testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So your testimony is very important. How old people are you? people uh, can challenge you in terms of the scriptures. I stayed right around the block from you. I grew up on Glendale, but but you are the top of Boston. I know that area, man. I know it like a people can challenge you. So um, the awakening is happening, and many people just need to hear a testimonial yeah. by King Agrippa and Shaul. He said, "You almost persuaded me." to be one of those good ones. It's in the original Greek, not Christian. But you almost persuaded me to be a good one, or from the sect, from Nazarene, or Nazareth. Because it was, it was considered a cult, right? Because we learned the Mashiach is from Nazareth. People are like, where they come on, the Mashiach, etc. So uh, we thank y'all for uh, Brother Bezalel. Yeah. <laughs> His YouTube is Kodesh Yisrael. Kodesh Yisrael, mm -hmm. you'll find information about um, what he does, etc. Now, I um, want a quick, quick question as I get into this really quickly. And um, I know your time is valuable. This is Shabbat. You all want to go home and do nothing. Hallelujah. <laughs> my mind can only retain what my blood can sustain. All right. So I got a quick question for you, really quickly, and we'll continue to get back into everything. Um, typically speaking, we as Israel, as humanity in general, um, we don't like the earth. We don't like the earth. The earth. We don't like the earth. Um, the earth to us is, um, we don't see it as, as something that plays a major role in eschatological events or end time events. We think the earth has nothing to do with Israel. So typically, we are distant when it comes to the earth. I don't hear a lot of doctrine concerning the earth. In fact, even in Christianity, um, we have embraced this theology, even in our songs, that you can give me, uh, you can have the whole wide world, but just give me Jesus. And Hasatan is saying, thank you. Because you don't, you have misappropriated the role of the earth. And if you don't understand the role of the earth, you will never understand this ketubah this marriage relationship between you and the Mashiach. So we have sung all type of crazy songs like I'll fly away, oh glory, yeah. oh, I'll fly away. Right? You better get yourself together. I got some place to go. I'm praying when you get there, you see everyone you know. You want to go to? You want to go? Well, the earth is not my home. I'm just passing through. <laughs> And we sing silly songs like that, and we fully don't understand the scriptures. Because if we fully understand the scriptures, we would know, according to Revelation chapter 12, that the earth is going to assist us in the time of tribulation. Revelation chapter 12 talks deeply about that. Now, this is only prolegomena. 
I don't want to go into it in detail because it will take away from what we really want to talk about. But I need to give you some prolegomena or backdrop as to how this thing with the Mashiach and the, his bride is set up. When you don't understand this context of the scripture, you don't understand your human relationship with your wife, with your boo, with your bae, or whatever you want to call them. Everything else is going to be misaligned and misconstrued if you don't get this. So Revelation says it's the earth is going to have to help us. Now, in Genesis or Bereshit chapter 1, the scripture says, uh, Yah created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, was dark, it was void, it was without form. Something went wrong with the earth. Is that correct? My question to you, what went wrong with the heavens? Is anything wrong with heaven? What was the purpose of Adam? So work had to be done here on earth. Is there work in heaven? Yes. No. What went wrong with the heavens? So something went wrong with the heavens? What was the solution when rebellion happened? Yeah, so. Say it again. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, so, but something went wrong with what? The earth. So Yah had to step out of eternity, step into time. Time has one purpose and one purpose only. That is to bring the earth. Back, back under the domain. Yeah. Back under the domain of heaven. Mm -hmm. Time only exists for one purpose and one purpose only. To bring everything back under the domain or earth back under the domain of heaven. Say everybody say heaven. heaven. So did y'all assign the angels to the earth to fix it? No. No, no he didn't, right? He didn't assign. He said, let us make what? Amen. And let them come live in heaven. No. No. Do you really think this Hebrew thing is really about going to heaven? If so, you are a, a recycled Christian. <laughs> Do you think life, y'all allow you to be born so that you can, you can, you can die and just make it up to heaven? You really think that that Yah is so linear in his design, linear, linear in his creation, that Yah created you so you can come here, so he create a world, so that you can just pass through it, so one day that you can go through the pilgrim progress of life, so eventually you can enter into heaven. If that's the case, he should have kept you in heaven. But what is your purpose? What is the purpose of Israel? That's why when the Mashiach returned, or when, when he uh, post-resurrection, the disciples said in Luke chapter 1, have you come, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1, have you come to restore the kingdom of Israel? The purpose is kingdom. Once the purposes of the kingdom is established, time will be no more. You're only in within this dynamic in the antiquity and the modernity of time. Why? To bring earth back under the domain of Yah. Adam, I want you to have what? Dominion. You think you Hebrews are just about about controlling other people, being it. But what is the purpose? That's why the Mashiach preached the kingdom. We're not kingdom minded. We're heavenly minded. I want to go to heaven. You go to heaven. And Christianity have somehow have drilled that within our our, our, our suke, drilled that within our psyche. This is about heaven. If heaven is your goal, you are. Misaligned with the Brit Hadashah and the Tanakh of, of the word. You are misaligned with the scriptures if your main goal is making it to heaven. 
you have become lazy, lethargic, yeah. laissez fair. And you are not doing the will of the Father. Yes, sir. Ah, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Because before, this is what we call antediluvian. So before, right, <laughs> earth had righteous people here. Yes. What is Adam's purpose? Y'all said, I'm sending you to have what? Dominion and do what? Replenish. And to do what? Replenish. To replenish. Replenish. That means there was somebody or something here on the earth in order for Adam to have to replenish it. It was already replenished in order to be replenished. What you talking about, Willis? Exactly. So when you understand, that's how. Um, when the scripture says, "In the spirit of the Most High moved upon the face of the deep," in Genesis, it's saying that really it's the fire and heat that <coughs> moved upon the glaciers. Why? Because when Hasatan fell from the Shamaim, he fell to earth. Earth became dark and low. And when things are dark, what's the temperature like? Cold. Everything what freeze. All civilization died. And so y'all have to move upon the face of the deep and melt everything. But when you don't do line upon line, precept upon precept, you'll miss it. Now, I said this with my message, because we can turn to Ezekiel and turn to other places that prove this to you. Through the prophets, as they're explaining what happens in the Antediluvian or in earlier times, right? And so that's why he said, let us make what? Man, not angels. So who is to have dominion in the earthly realm? Amen. Let me say it again. Who is to have dominion? Amen. Man. So why are we here? Amen. Israel, why are we here? Take back the earth. To what? Take back the earth. We are here to work. But we are lazy. We minimize the awakening to gathering on Shabbat. We minimize the awakening for just doing the feast. And the awakening is much more than just feast gathering. Yeah. It's much more than Shabbat and honoring the commandments. These are the laws and the policies of the kingdom, yeah. but you're missing the kingdom itself. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, that's why. Um, <laughs> The earth is rebuking us for our laziness. You have hurricanes, you have tsunamis, you have storms, you have all these things that are rebuking us. Why? Because we talk about kingdom people. There's a work to be done here in earth in time. In time. That's why the scripture said, in the fullness of time, y'all sent the son. So we only operate in time. Time only exists to bring the earth back under the domain of the Most High. That's why Yahusha, um, the next time you see Yahusha, time will be no more. Time will be no more. And so Israel, we are designed to do what? We are designed to work. So I think the Mashiach said it best when he said, talked about the... By the way, what is the Lord's Prayer? John 15. Thank you. Please don't say Matthew. My Father, return to heaven. How will you that day? Let's go there. Let's start to recite this prayer. In that, let's say that together. Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy thine. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. But you want to go. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is where? As it is where? As it is where? I want the same environment that's in the heavens. I want to be in earth. 
to, to the point you don't know the difference. That's when heaven and earth will merge. Come on. Because I have dominion there and here. Now, would someone try to interfere with the assignment and the atmosphere of heaven? What do they do? They cast them out. Yeah. Out of darkness. So my question is, who has dominion in the heavens? Yah and who? And the angels. The angels understood their purpose. They were, were not going to allow anyone to interfere with their assignment. And the moment someone tried to interfere with their assignment, what happened? They did what? They did what? Come on. Who's going to be responsible for casting out Hastan out of the earthly reign? Israel. Who? Israel. Israel. You rebuke the earth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fly away. I'm on my way to heaven. You a lazy believer. Because mm -hmm. we've been sent here to do what? To do what? Word. To do what? Word. We've been sent here to do the work of the kingdom. That's why this prayer in John 17, he said, Father, in fact, you're praying something different than the Mashiach prayed. John 17, he prayed a prayer. And what did he say? He said, Father, he said, as you and I are one, I pray that what? That they will be one, right? I pray that they will be one. He said, but take them not out of this world, but keep them from what? Take them not out of this what? Wait a minute, the Mashiach said, don't take them out of this world. You said you could have the whole wide world. Yeah. You are praying something contrary to what the Mashiach is praying. His prayer is keep them in this world. Don't take them out of this world. Just keep them from the wicked one. Because your goal, your assignment is to regain dominion. Now, that was the second way into what I wanted to say. That was for a Why? Because how do you regain this dominion? Who is called the second Adam? Mashiach. Mashiach. Who failed the first assignment? Adam. Who's going through accomplish that assignment? The Mashiach. How he's going to do it? Who led Adam into the wilderness, into the forest? Who? The woman needed. The woman needed. Who's going to lead the Mashiach into the work? Who? Who? Guess what? The Mashiach is not going to heal nobody else. He's done healing people. When he said it is finished, it is done. He's, going to raise. He's not going to raise up anybody else. He's not going to do it. He said it is finished. It's done. He said now I'm giving my name. All power under heaven is given unto me. And I give it unto you. And greater, worse. greater, worse. greater, worse. greater, worse. greater, worse. greater shall you do. Yes. So he's not going to do it. In other words, you're going to bear his name and do it. His bride is going to do the work. So that leads us into, good, I got 15 more minutes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that was all introduction. <laughs> now, last week we started talking about the ketubah. It's very important that you understood that so you can understand. That's why we talked about when um, Adam needed a wife, what happened? Uh, he called the deep state to come upon, and out of his side came what? Woman. This woman. When the Mashiach needed a wife, what happened? What's the Christ needed a wife? So, what are the things you need to understand about? Um, the scriptures as they speak allegorically, they speak in terms of anthropomorphisms, they speak in terms of um, similes and economies. Take my class in the Hebrew Academy, you'll find out what all those things are. All right. Um, but when you talk about Christ, whenever the scripture mentioned Jesus or Yahusha, it's talking about the physical person. But whenever it's talk about Christ, the bride 
is always in reference because Christ is not a person, or the Mashiach is not a person. It's a generation. It's spiritual. Right? So Yahusha is physical, but Mashiach makes him spiritual. So because he's a spirit, right? he had to marry a spirit. But there was none around. So Yah had to call him what? Just like he did with Adam. A deep sleep to come upon the Mashiach. Out of his side, on Calvary's tree, came this mystical substance. Thus we begin the Brah. Now, I wanted to give you that so you can fully understand where we are coming from. Last week, we talked about the importance of what we call the Ketubah. Everybody say Ketubah. 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 A ketubah is an agreement. We're going to see how ketubah, how the Mashiach has a ketubah with you. And it's very important that you don't, as Israel, you don't break that ketubah. Because the bride responsibility is to get the work done in the earthly realm to bring the kingdom back. And that's why the Mashiach always preach about the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. So ketubah means it is written. Say that with me. It is, is written. written. That's what a ketubah means. Ketubah is an agreement that you sign between two people. It is forbidden for couples to stay together, although there's a commitment between the two, but you cannot stay together until the fulfillment of that ketubah. There's two parts of the ketubah. And one means, you're mine, I'm yours, but we can't stay with each other. Until the fulfillment, because there's a work that man has to do in order to come back to fulfill the second part of the ketubah. So for those who are married couples and those who are engaged, who will be at my home tomorrow, we're going to really, we're going to have you design your own ketubahs. And so you can see that. Now, that's why you see the symbolism. You see the, um, the striking resemblance. You see the mimicking between... Human relationship of husband and wife and Christ in his bride. <coughs> Husbands, love your wife. Even as love. have love what? So you see this striking resemblance between the two. You are going to fail at every human relationship in your life if you fail to see the spiritual connection between you and the Mashiach. If even if your, your, your relationship lasts so long, it lasts because of lust, because of, of interest, or what, but you will never understand the full significance of why you're together with somebody. You don't understand covenant relationships. You understand contracts. And you break those contracts because he ain't kidding me right. He's breast thing. <laughs> she don't fish me no food. Yeah. He, he, look, he, get, he looked at my cousin when she was walking past. <laughs> we need to talk about all those things. Because you miss it and you don't fully understand. So last week, I'll, I'll skip over one really quick. We talked about number one, folks, this is about covenant, right? It's about covenant relationship. Number one, we talked about the selection of the bride. Right? How was the bride selected? Her father. By whom? Father. By the father, right? Oh, that's why he said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. So the father is very intentional when it comes to selecting the bride for the son. Now, I don't know why y'all selected y'all, but he did. He said, Israel is going to be my bride. She's my son, but she's also my bride. We'll, we'll explain to you the difference between those two at some point. And for those who, a couple months ago, I think we did a teaching on it in terms of the son. So we saw that in terms of, Scripture says, in a multitude of counselors, there are safety. Part of Hebraic culture is you just don't up and say, I like somebody, and we're just going to become, we're going to be talk one another, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to um, shack up, meet up, um, friends with benefits, um, whatever you want to call your relationship, and then think you are an item. I saw the scriptures misused and abused by people who feel like, well, since we were intimately involved, legally, you're my wife, and I'm your husband. That is not consistent with the scriptures. That's lust talking. That's not righteousness talking. That's right. 
Because according to the scriptures, Hebraic call, but Christianity have convoluted the Hebraic meaning of the scriptures. And so as a result, we think, oh, it's consummated. No, that's fornication. But we need to prove it to you in terms of the scripture. By the way, before we go to um, number two, um, we see last week we talked about um, Abraham when he um, sought to find Isaac a wife. He was involved. Who else was involved? His servant named Eleazar. Eleazar means hell is my help or Yah is my help. God is my help. Now, we went over last week. Does Yah select your partner? Yes or no? No. no. You don't pick your partner? No. Is there only one right person for you? No. no. We went over those dynamics, right? Because why? Who's the third person entity that's involved in the decision-making process? You are. Don't you ever think God is going to put you with somebody without asking your opinion? That's why the scripture says, and he wrought. Eve to Adam, the word wrought means he presented to her. It was a present. He put her on display. But he had to choose. That's always the heart of the Father. I put before you this day life and death. Blessings and curses. You what? Choose. You choose. So the choice is always going to be. He said, but well, here's a hint. I'd rather that you choose what? Life. So here. Here's somebody I'm going to bring in your path. I hope you choose her. I, I want you to choose her. But he'll never make the decision for you. So this is important when it comes to human relationship. Now, what are some things you should be looking for? Right? Or your parents should be looking for? Or people in your life. See, you can't just halfway do this Hebrew thing. Nope. Are you going? You can't just embrace the scriptures without embracing the culture. Mm -hmm. And there is culture when it comes to ketubah, when it comes to marriages, when it comes to relationships. There's ketubah because we do everything based on Torah. Right? Torah is the instructions that the Most High has given us. So, what should, what should you be looking for? Or those people involved, the committee, as I call it. The committee of people. Right? See, we're afraid to run that person by by people mm -hmm. in authority. Mm -hmm. Run by your parents. Run by me. Mm -hmm. What do you think of? Him? He ain't no good. Mm -hmm. PT, what do you think of? Him? He ain't no good. <laughs> He's he Y'all, what do you think of? Him? <laughs> uh, I am here. Man. So we ignore voices. That's why the scripture says, and a multitude of counselors, they are sacred. And whatever your purposes are, when you don't submit it to someone else, they're going to fall. And we have constant, perpetual falling in Israel because we don't take counsel in life. We do our own thing. Right, sure. And that is indicative to a number of failed relationships that we have. So what should we be looking for? Obviously, number one, folks, um, I won't put this high on the list, but attraction. you got to be physically attracted to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Huh? No. Is that lust? I mean, it could be. Now, was 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 Jacob physically attracted to Leah? No. The scripture says she had tender eyes. You know what that is? She was cross-eyed. No. He didn't. He didn't like her, did he? No. No. He didn't like her at all. But was he still true to his covenant that he had with her? Yes. That's right. So the first thing you should be looking for, I always quote Psalms of Vision 42. But the scripture says that the deer path that after the water, so does my heart. So long it for you. When you look for spiritual attributes in people, it lessens folks the people that you hook up with. I feel sorry for Israel because you're still, women and men both, we are still dating outside of our culture. Now, I'm not talking about people who look just like you. I'm talking about the Israelite culture. You are unequally yoked. I'm not talking about those individuals who are grandfathered in and you're both in Christianity and now you came into the truth and your spouse is still stuck. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you are making a willful decision because of loneliness. Loneliness is a spirit. It is a spirit that I am, um, um, I'm not worthy, and I don't have nothing worthy to give. 
See, coming into the truth does not dehumanize you. So the first thing you should be looking for is spiritual. Check their spirituality. Before you check anything else, watch them in terms of their spiritual life. Right? For instance, when it comes to my children, I'm responsible as a man. Right? <laughs> School call about, about Josh. It ain't. Who is this? Yes, this is uh, Utica uh, Middle School calling on behalf of Calling for Joshua Howard and uh, his parents here. Hey, Tawana! <laughs> the school, the school on the phone for Josh. Come get the phone. <laughs> I am responsible as the male. Real men reject passivity. Hebrew men reject passivity. They accept responsibility and they lead courageously. Now, hey, Tawana! Hey, Adrian! <laughs> no, but I take responsibility for that. Right? So that's important. Also, when things happen, guess what? I'm praying. My children should be praying. So when things happen, you're like, call the EMS. Go somewhere. My wife needs to see that I take charge and that I'm a praying man. When you feel the law of the Most High, you are a praying man. You don't run to anybody and call me, call mom and see what mom wants to do. No, prayer. So it's very important in terms of of the spiritual life, right? Um, when it comes to that. Um, but phys physical reality has a lot to do with it, being physical. Because nobody says, ooh, he got that Holy Ghost on her. Ooh, wee. He's got much day in the way. Ooh, wee. Now, not. <laughs> um, I don't want to go there. All right. Uh, um, should I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, there is um, there is a term. This is all time. Um, where you are, you are attracted to someone because of their, their intellectuality. So, um, what, what is it called? Sapio 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 sexual sapio sexual. Um, it's when you're, so that would happen. Like, oh man, they're knowledgeable. They, that's good and all of that. But the first thing that should attract you folks is not their physical specimen, although it's something that attracts you. Um, because at the bottoms, folks, given enough time, will turn into apple pears. <laughs> <laughs> so, after a while, folks, the physical changes. What you should be looking for, and what that's why in Hebrew culture, it wasn't just the physical that attracted you, it was the spiritual that attracted you. If we want to do it right, so the first thing you should be looking for is somebody who's in the truth, who's in the faith. We'll say it on this side. First thing you should be looking for is somebody who's in the truth, who's in the faith. Because if not, your life is going to be a living hell. Mm -hmm. You got that? Yeah. You got it? Yep. All right, number two you should be looking for is, so we're talking about spirituality, you should be looking for the mentality. Right? Because you can hook up with somebody who is, I use this term, but I'm going to use it for this, Stupid. <laughs> they they carry. They have no. They're not witty. They're not quick. They're not intelligent. They're a difficult person to have a conversation with. And it's like, oh my goodness. goodness. You know what I'm saying, though. You know what I'm saying, though. <laughs> you you won't say, girl. Girl, I'm telling you, girl. But you know what I'm saying, though. But you know, girl, I, you know what I'm saying, though. No, I don't understand what you are saying. But you understand, though, what I'm trying to understand, though. You don't understand, though. Right? Yeah. Right. So one of the things I like about my wife um, is that she sparks my intellectuality. It's very important. Mentally, she... Um, she stimulates me. Right. Because the mental capacity is important. And we'll show you several examples of that when we get to the fourth part of this ketubah. 
is that there has to be someone that's stimulating you mm -hmm. in, in your mental faculties, your mental capacity when it comes to that. So Juan and I talk, have pillow talk, we talk about ministry, we talk about job, we talk about a lot of things, right? Um, and so we talk about politics, we talk about the Bible, we talk about sometimes sports, pretty well. Um, but it got to be someone who, who stimulates you, right? Um, and particularly me, because I talk for a living. Too much. <laughs> so I talk a lot more than that. So it's got to be someone who stimulate you in terms of that, right? Because I, I, I teach on the collegiate level, I, I teach uh, Torah, and so I'm always talking for a living. So I need somebody to stimulate. Because if not, what's going to happen is somebody else is going to come along and they are going to stimulate me mentally. And I'm going to find myself attracted to that person. And it's by is natural, yeah. is organic, mm -hmm. and so now I have to ward off those temptations. Because yeah. yeah. temptation can only happen, y'all hear me Israel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When there's desirability and there is availability. Mm -hmm. You gotta minimize availability because a person can be available, mm -hmm. but you don't desire them. Mm -hmm. Or you can desire them, but they ain't available. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be watch out for those things, and that's why you have to be equally <clears> yoked, <throat> even mentally. Right? You gotta be able to connect with someone mentally. Everybody say mentally. Right? So next one is emotional. Right? Um, they can be good spiritually, have a relationship with God, be in the truth. They can have a good conversation with you, but emotionally they cannot connect what you've been through. They have no connection in terms of that. And um, one of the reasons why many of our spouses, particularly women, don't open up to men because they can't trust me. Can I trust you with my vulnerabilities? Can I trust you with my hurts? Typically, when a man and a woman say they can't trust each other, when a woman says she can't trust a man, nine times out of ten, it has to deal with fidelity issues. Most of the issues. Right? But when a man says he can't trust a woman, it's typically because he has shared his vulnerability with her. And women, Israel women, go read Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 4. You all do not fight fair. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's why the scripture says it's better to be on a corner of a rooftop than be in a room with an Israelite contentious woman. Because all those things when I was vulnerable, when I'm a man, because I don't remember crying on the list, but in one moment I was vulnerable with you. And I shared with you what happened as a child. And now all of a sudden, now we get into fast forward, we get into an argument. And that's why you, when you were younger, that's why you and all of a sudden, wow, that comes up. Because women are driven by emotions. That's where we get the word emote. It's a root word which means to be moved. Right? They tend to be not logical when they're arguing. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> 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 but, but but they haven't let you in typically because it's it's, it's a trust issue. Can I trust you with what's paining me every day? And here's the thing: it's the response of Israel men. When we read throughout the Tanakh, it's their responses, which is misogynistic, it is um, unattached. There is no connection. Now you're at a point where I just want you to listen to me. I just want you to listen to my heart. And, and when she's poured on her heart, his response is, what you want me to do about this? Wow. It happened in the past. <laughs> See, you don't make a connection with your emotion. Right. Now I'm going to get to all these in point four. Right? Because point four, I'm going to show you scripture after scripture, how the Torah says how to connect with them Emotionally, how the brick, how the shot says, me and naturally, you don't love what? like that. So as a commandment, husband, love your wives. In other words, I want to invoke this emotion out of you. Because me and is just covenant. It's a duty. It gives them, it provides them legally to get a piece of you. And that's the issue. When men just want a piece of you. 
Because if they only want a piece of you, and women give it all. I'm trying to get to the core, folks. I don't want to be like Christian and being philosophical and all this. I want to get to the scripture, but y'all ain't let me. Um, <clears throat> a man, can a man cheat on a woman and still love her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, they can. Can a woman cheat on a man and still love the man? No. Tell you why. If a man cheat on a woman, and genuinely, because there's some need that has not been met, and he has a need to be needed, or he has a legitimate need, but he's trying to meet that need illegitimately by breaking his covenant with his spouse. But this woman, listen to me, she connected me emotionally. My wife don't do that. She connected me mentally. This woman feeds into me, but you don't. I'm married to Leah, but I'm in love with Rachel. So when a man, she can cheat and listen, I'm sorry, I don't even do it. But when a woman do it, a woman, she, here's how you know whether or not she's alone with you. She'll get real, real close, but another man is like, Does she go all the way through it? And typically, yes. There are different standards when it comes to men and women, when it comes to um, fidelity issues. Because right? a man, he expects to be forgiven. But you do that on a man, one time. I don't care if he still stay with you mentally, he has not forgiven you. It's over, because men are territorial. <laughs> She convinced Adam, who said he loved y'all. He, he was so connected to this woman that he was able to leave his rightful position in y'all. To operate in a realm independent from y'all. And so we do that. We, we do that. And then physical should be the last one. Um, and so the bear should only come as a result of these three being fulfilled. Right? So that's why we develop these soul ties and all these other things, this mentality and and so that climax, folks, are physical. So only come because of the other three is there. Now, what do the other three have to do? Let's go to point number two. Here's what in a ketubah, number one. So when it comes to the selection of the bride, number two is the is the price that was established. There was a price that had to pay be paid for a wife. You didn't walk up and say, "I want to marry you." I wish we did. I'm trying to get the scripture. <laughs> Mm. We ain't got nowhere to go. Adam! <laughs> what is the first thing that Adam had? Adam had number one, he had what? A relationship with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing, he had a what? He had a job. He had a job. It, it, it was to cultivate the garden, right? Yeah. And tilt the garden. He had a job. Yeah. Anytime you are women, yo, bro, you have already. Misconstruing the whole idea of the great way when you got the car, you got to pick him up. Yeah. You can never go to his place because he ain't got a place, so you got to go to some other place. I don't want to say that because we're not promoting anything, right? You got to go to the other place for dinner and all that already, but you are so desperate 
but you have become the Isaiah chapter 4 woman that says, you don't have to buy my food, you don't have to buy my apparel, you don't have to buy uh, my necessities, as long as I can be called by your name. And the scripture says there's going to be seven to one. Which brings up an interesting uh, question. Is Israel only to marry Israel? Yes. yes. Hmm. In Israel, there are, there are seven to one. Right now, it's about the scriptures being fulfilled. There are seven to one. So, so that means there automatically creates this competition among the sisterhood. Ooh. <laughs> so there's competition among the sisterhood. Because now I have to outdo you and fight. And in our community, whether we want to acknowledge or not, there's something called sloppy polygamy. Most of you don't have to raise your hand, but most women, Hebraic women, so-called African-American women, if you have more than one child, 80% have at least two fathers. Because there's a scarcity of these men in our community. And every every football, you know, championship, somebody win an MVP, award. I thank God for mom. Daddy is never mentioned. Because there's competition. Now you've got to outdo the other sisters because you're vying for one man. And that's what it happened even back then. You want the reason why a lot of what we call um, but a lot of that happened because it was protection for women when it comes to polygyny and polygamy and, and, and so on and so forth. But we, that's not our topic. We won't discuss that. But there was a reason why that happened. It was for protection. Who's going to protect the woman of Israel now? Because now she got hormones. She want to be with somebody. But there's scarcity in me. So I have to trample over somebody else's husband. In order to, or travel with somebody else's wife, in order to get with somebody who belongs to someone else. Mrs. Jones, uh, we got a thing going on. So, watch this. So, the price has to be paid. So, number one, selection of the bride. Number two, selection. I mean, a price. So, a price would have to be paid. Paid. So, that's why the Mashiach or Yahusha being our bridegroom, paid a very high price for his bride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the price he paid was what? His life. He gave a price. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, For ye are brought with a bought with a price. Therefore, glory yah, glorify Yah in your body and your spirit, which ye are not. So we're going to see how this played out. Because everything points back to the Hebraic marriage customs. All right? So, number three is the bride and the groom, they betroth to each other. Now, do betroth means marry? No. No. <coughs> so, when someone has gone through a betrothal process, there are two steps. Everybody say two steps. Two steps. So, there's two steps to this marriage process. So, the first step of the betrothal process, it, it literally binds the bride and the groom together in a marriage con contract. So that means we are legally bound to one another, except you're not physically living with one another. So we are in a different place, but you're still, you're still bound to one another in terms of in a covenant type of way, which means there's no way out of it. The only way out of it is death. You have no way out of it, right? So, um, whenever you accept even Yahuwah um, into your life, you be, we become the, the, um, the prop with him, right? We become a prop, which means there's a covenant, which means I can't go anywhere else. Number four, really quickly, is a written down, a written document is drawn up. So this is the contract that states the bride price, the promises of the groom. This one, I promise to do for you. You can, you have to keep your promises. And you're like, baby, I love you. I get out of jail. First thing you do, go find a woman. 
I'm not going to help take care of it. Put it back on their feet. I'm going to get on their feet. You like me? You just throw your. But wait, wait. You went to the guy in prison saying, "Hey, Mark, you know we don't. I just want a family. I just want to love you." And you got into the opioid every time because you're vulnerable and you're weak, right? And so, um, so this is it's a written down contract in terms of um, you promise to support, you promise to honor, you promise to uh, you know maintain her in the truth and keep her in the truth provide food, clothing, necessities. This is part of the ketubah, folks, that is written down. So it's a contract. contract, And it was on, on um, uh, this, this contract that you develop between you and the bride, right? Now, it must be executed and signed prior to the wedding ceremony. So you're not married yet. right? It's signed before the wedding ceremony, right? And so it is a contract that we make with Yah. So all the promises that Yah provided for us are legally, when you look at the scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, they are legally ours. It's a contract that we make with one another. So the agreement is called what again? Ketubah. Ketubah. So it's the wedding agreement called Ketubah. And so um, Ketubah, after the terms of the Ketubah was accepted, watch this. What was drunk as a sign of that there is the ketubah, the first part is signed? Wine. What? Wine. What? Wine. What? Wine has always been associated with a break marriage ceremonies. The first miracle that the Mashiach. And where was it at? At Canaan, Galilee, right? The wedding of Canaan, Galilee. He turned water to wine where? At a wedding. Because wine is always represented. So it was a cup of wine that was shared and that sealed the marriage covenant. Right? And so the couple was considered to be married even though the marriage had not been consummated yet. So when you drink that wine, oh, you married. You just can't be intimate with him right now. Because it is because it you can't be you can't consummate it yet until the marriage ceremony. So folks, all of this takes place before the marriage ceremony, right? So the bride kind of resided with her family until the time of the wedding. She didn't stay, go with him and say, Well, we decide. No, she stayed until the time of the marriage. So especially uh, this is the most interesting part about the Katuma, Katuma is the, the groom had to go and complete certain tasks, right? He had to complete provision, go get provision for the bride. Because if you didn't have enough money to sustain her, you shouldn't get married. Now, before we go any further, are y'all sure y'all want to go back to the Hebraic culture of marriage? Or do y'all want the American way? Yeah. The Babylonian. The right Hebrew. You will never understand it from a Hebraic perspective until you understand this. Nobody, and I will marry nobody until the man is financially secure to take care of the woman. Now, I'm not saying you have to marry a, a Bill Gates. From time to time, he will struggle, he will lose his job. He may not have provision. But the real man of God always have vision. Right? Always have vision, right? Um, and so that's important when it comes to this covenant relationship. Ketuba again means it is written, right? In other words, it is forbidden for couples to even live together without ketuba. Because um, even if the ketuba was lost, another one had to be written. We see that in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, we see this as a ketubah um, or any type of agreement. The scripture says if the law of the commandments were lost or stolen, another one had to be rewritten. So you have to rewrite it because you were bound by that ketubah. Now, ketubah or the drinking of this wine is instituted when or where in terms of the first part of the agreement between us and the Mashiach. Remember, wine had to be 
involved. Passover. Passover. Matthew chapter 26, 27 to 28 says, Then having taken by what? A cup. After he gave thanks and gave it the cup to them, saying, You must all drink from this cup. For this is my blood of the covenant is what? There's a written document. This is the blood of the covenant, which was poured out on behalf of many for what? The forgiveness of sin. Luke chapter 22 and 20. It's got this precept. This is the cup of the. It's already now putting it together for you. Saying that it is an agreement. Now it's taking a cup in the New Testament and saying, when you talk about, when we read Ezekiel chapter 36, Jeremiah chapter 31 about the new covenant, he's saying this is the cup, already saying that the new covenant is already a marriage that's going to take place between us and Yah. It is a new covenant that now he's going to put his spirit in us now. And he's going to put his law in us now. It is a covenant. So whenever you begin to look at whether the Mashiach is performing miracles, whether he's given words of uh, speaking parabolically, whether uh, he's doing any type of peace, it's all connected to you and him. There is a ketubah. There's a marriage ceremony that's been happening. So ketubah has two parts, as I said before. It involved sharing of the wine. That's why the Mashiach said, I won't drink of this cup of the vine until when? I drink it anew with you in my father's house. Now, one of the things that the marriage took place, the marriage always took place at the father's house. Always. All right? And so, um, so the first part happens um, during drinking of the wine is during the initial acceptance, right? It means that you accept this person, right, in terms of the marriage. And then the other is during the consummation. You don't drink until the marriage is actually consummated um, itself. And so we, we get say, so the second part only happens when a wedding actually happens. That's when you share the second cup of the wine. So you see the connection with the, where the Mashiach said, I'm not going to drink with you now, but I'm going to drink with you anew in my father's kingdom. That's what happened in the Hebrew marriage. So notice the Yahusha, the Mashiach said, uh, to honor the new covenant. That this Passover, and that's why we partake in Passover, we take partake in Passover, is typically we are remembering him. He is the groom who had to return to heaven to go and to prepare what? That's what the groom do. The groom takes a time and go to prepare a place for us. Right? To prepare a place for us. And so when we look at the Mashiach and look at the relationship that he had for us or with us, we have to understand during the first part of the agreement, we drunk wine, there was an agreement, we signed the agreement, the woman went back to her folks' house, and he went out to make provision. The Mashiach said, I'm going away. I'm making provision for you at my father's house. Okay? Continue, you, Sam. First Corinthians chapter, uh, First Corinthians chapter eleven. Likewise, also the cup after the supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant by means of my blood. You must regularly do this as often as you would drink it and remember to me. For as often as you would eat of my bread and you would drink of this cup, you are proclaiming publicly the death of uh, Yahusha until he will come." Mark chapter. 14, verse 24 to 25, and he said unto them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out on behalf of many. Truly I say to you that never again am I drinking from the stream of vine until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. Continue that. So, number five is the bride must give her consent. She must consent to it. Right? So, it's not like you mind now. The way Israelites do some wedding now is crazy. As women, it's a piece of property. So you must consent to it. Right? 
go Sam. Okay. Um, and then, of course, there's the mahar. Mahar is the bride, is the price for the mahar of the bride. Look at the scripture. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Or do I do not know that your body is the sanctuary of the Ruach that's in you, which you have from God, and you do not belong to your selves. Why? Because the Mohar, whenever a man paid, a woman could not terminate those agreements once she met, had she consented to it. She could not terminate that agreement. She can't even date anybody else. No man can talk to her or anything. Why? Because she don't belong to herself anymore. That's why the scriptures are using this language here. This is language that says you do not belong to yourself. You've been bought with a price. It's, it's talking about marriage covenant. Marriage uh, a type of terminology here. Right? Now you must glorify Yah with your body. First Peter chapter 1. Knowing that you have been redeemed not from corruptible things like silver and gold from a feudal living handed down from your fathers, but by the precious blood of the Mashiach <coughs> as the unblemished spotless man. Let's go to the next one, Sam. Right. So gifts were given, and we'll talk about on that next week. But now we'll get to the exciting part. Before I have to get all the prolegomena out of the way, we need to get to the exciting part of how this looks. Gifts were given to the bride, and a cup was called the cup of the covenant was shared between the bride and the groom. And so there must be a cup of the covenant. So the first cup, which is a um, be, be, uh, be a frother process, you know, you be frothing someone. But this is the cup of the covenant. That's why the Mashiach said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, or the cup of the covenant, until I drink it new with you in my father's house. Ironically, the second cup that you drink from is called the cup of covenant. You see how the Mashiach used language that they understood in a rare time. Are y'all drinking from the cups now? Mm. We ain't talk about Moet, you know. I mean, we all drinking. <laughs> all right. So, of course, then the bride had water immersion. All right. It's called the. And we'll go over this in detail. This is called, folks, the mikva. Mikva. There was a cleansing. All right. See, once I go with this, y'all gonna be able to identify and appropriate with yourself. The mashiach. All right. There's a cleansing. There's an immersion that happened. Before the wedding. It's not both of them Just the woman. Just the woman. Just the woman. But we are the bride of what? Of the Mashiach. So even men, in this sense, we are women. But a woman is a mikvah food. That means you were you were cleansed. You were washed. Right? Go Sam. Of course, now is the bridegroom departed. Going back to his father's house to prepare the bridal chains. It's very important. So that's why you, until you, unless you had a place separately, a father will always build a chamber for his son. So you see the terminology he used. In my father's house, there are many chambers. There are many chambers. So, oh, match! I got a match in heaven. Yes. But we don't understand the Hebrew culture. And we don't understand the Hebrew culture. You're not going to fully understand um, what the, the Mashiach is saying. Um, so my father's house continues. I just want to go through these. I'm going to pick up on all of these. I think we stopped at five. And next week I'm going to start at five. So the bride was um, consecrated and set apart for a period of time while the bridegroom was away building the house. So you were you were you were in a very, um, you went out doing your own thing. I'm not engaged, but I'm still going out and get out and go do this. Or, you know, no, no. We'll get to that, but it's the deep in the bridegroom. You'll make sense when we read Revelation. Right? Levity is the bridegroom did not know when his father would declare 
in the bridal chamber was a fit and would send him uh, to go get his bride. There's a lot of parallels when it comes to this hero. Because the bridegroom would, did not know. That's why the Mashiach said, um, I don't know when I'm going to return. He said, no man knows the what? The day or the hour. We do know the season though, right? We know. For those in Hebrew, we know the season. We know the season which he's going to return. But we do not know the day nor the hour in which he's going to return. He said, even I don't know that. That fits Hebrew culture. Because it was the father of the groom declared when the chambers were ready. When everything was ready. It's the father's responsibility. So, obviously I wanted you all to somehow um, make this applicable and make this, this need to be um, some um, be relevant and, and palliative to your own uh, relationship with the Most High, but also when it comes to relationship as well. Other people were involved. You did not make the lonely soul decision in and of yourself. That is dangerous. And you're going to end up with somebody who's cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. <laughs> because you didn't use the counsel that was necessary. I look up Israel and I see a lot of broken and damaged relationships. That's why I remember you have already been divorced already. Some of you are on the verge of divorce. It's a crazy thing because we don't do it his way. All right? Of course, the bridegroom will return with a shout. That's what happened. It was a proclamation. I'm about to get married. Going to the chapel. All right? And so, um, in a sound of a ram's horn will be blown. I'll tell you, I'll go over all these this week. Um, so, y'all want to know. Then there was a hoopah. You might know what a hoopah is. No, no, no. A hoopah. What is a hoopah ceremony? Um, uh, what they call the... Um, uh-huh. A hoopah. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the Bantu scribe, they still do that today. Yeah. Now, there was knocking. We'll talk about knocking a little bit different, right? Because there was knocking as well. I'm going to show you what knocking is. Behold, I stand at the door in. Right? If any man what? I will come in with him and sup with him, right? So knocking, he's talking about knocking had to do with some, there was some sexual connotations there. That's why I know three about three couples we're going to have a ketubah ceremony. We're going to do every step by step by step by step by step. I want to renew my vows. We will be here twenty years. All right. So, um, so hoopah. So hoopah was what? What does hoopah stand for? We are under what? The house or the protection of who? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll go over that. Um, yeah, because Deuteronomy talks about that deeply. Because it's a description. Right? And then a ceremonial is the second coming of the bond. We talked about that. And then lastly, of course, um, uh, there will be a marriage supper. I'm all the guests. A marriage supper, that was the marriage, um, which we call the reception. But there's a deep connotation in there, folks. I just wanted to go through it so that some of you are taking notes. So next week, we can go into detail. Stand with you. Papa Yah, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your glory. Uh, we thank you that ultimately we are married to you. We've been along with a price. This price was a lofty price. In fact, we've been redeemed. Uh, Give along to ourselves. We've been uniquely bought with a price. Lift your hands in the presence of the Almighty God. Whenever two or three Israelites are gathered, there he is in the midst. We have had a number of relationships that have went awry. Some from our doing, some from our perpetrators. For your perpetrator may not be here. Your ex may not be here. But we had said, it's not my mother, it's not my brother, it's not my father. Because me alone stands in the need of prayer. 
I pray that during this time that there be hurt, pain, rejection, and scar that's been caused by the opposite sex. There's a heavy spirit of um, that I sense in here of violation. Many have been sexually abused. Somehow that has morphed into your personality. Now you're fighting to get control of what you couldn't control in the past. You have built this wall to protect yourself. In an effort to protect yourself, this wall is imprisoning you. You've been married for 20, 30 years now, and you still got the wall up. You're 40 years old, you still got the wall up. Many of you men have been spiritual, castrated. And women have been violated to the point even scarred so deeply that you have made excuses for your condition. Therefore, you have given it a license to remain. You have a legitimate need, but you're trying to meet those needs in an illegitimate way. Father Yah is willing and able to heal the shame and the guilt that you're using. The heavy spirit of violation, rape. As a child, you've been violated. And all of this has deep, deep consequences terms of you living out a healthy relationship. Not being healed of traumatic experiences drastically affect your ability to connect to means. So here you are, you're hiding. Still deal with these fears and phobias. Whom the Mashiach set free. It's truly free indeed. Here's an opportunity as you're in the presence of God just to pour your heart and to release. To cry out before him. I will be healed. Things cannot be healed unless they are revealed. A confession is made known unto salvation. Your freedom only comes Confess your thoughts one to another that it may produce healing. If you're in an environment with trusted ox and a cotise. You're no longer vulnerable. Somebody have preyed on your vulnerability. And as a result, you even have this wall up against the most high God. I would want to tell you some things. Allah wants to be be intimate with you. And to me, you see. But your brokenness with man, how commonly your relationship with him. Wherever you are, just begin to cry out unto God. We annihilate the plans of the wicked one. The curse that caused it shall not come. We've been through a betrothal process with you. We brought to you. And we are brought to you, Baba. I pray that you will heal us of deep, deep pain and deep, deep insecurities. You want a bride without spot or blemish or any such thing. Heal us of the hurt, the trauma of our past. We will forget those 
things which are behind and press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. There's no such thing as an unexpressed emotion, unexpressed feeling. You suppress it one way, it's gonna come out in another way. Food have become your solace. Sexual perverseness have become, and pornography have become your solace. Inordinate affections have become your solace. But you have not allowed Yah to heal Israel. You replace it with activity. And you are medicating your pain with activity. Some of you are jumping from relationship to relationship. This person to that person. Looking for fulfillment. Only a place that y'all can fulfill. The chair that's behind you and in front of you has a purpose. The purpose of that chair is to carry the weight of a seated person. I can use that same chair to put geek boys in it. I can put a Bible in that chair. I can put a purse in that chair. I can put a jacket over it. But that's not designed to carry purses. It was not designed to carry your Bibles. That's designed for you to put a coat behind it. The purpose of the chair is to carry the weight of a seated person. And although I can put a chair there, a, a Bible there, I can put a phone there, I can put a cup on it, I can put a Bible on it, it's still not fulfilling its purpose unless a person is seated in it. Many of you in your lives, you have filled your life with decoys. Filled it with activity. You have not allowed y'all to sit at the hem of your life. Father, by the Ruach, I pray that you will open up not only the eyes of their understanding, but open the heart, which is callous, which is hard. The heart that's defensive. That heart of stone. You know, a heart of flesh. That trauma that pulls their hearts. That pain have hardened their affections. They don't trust again. They don't believe again. I believe, but help my unbelief. Come on, lift your hands before the Most High Yah. Here's what I weigh as we make a connection with Yah. You're still carrying the trauma and the blows of the ex-marriage. Some of you have been carrying the scars of being sexually abused and emotionally abused. You've been violated. Having truth is one thing. Operating in the spirit is a whole different. You can regurgitate the truth. You can intellectualize the truth. But what the spirit does, the spirit goes into the depths, the crevices of your heart. The psalmist says, Yah, I desire truth in the inward parts. You've been violated. Hard for you to overcome that violation. Because everybody have a trigger point. When you're not fully healed and delivered, you have a trigger point. Things trigger you. But I am the most high yah. I change my mind. But everything else in your life was inconsistent and everything was nebulous. I've been the only consistent thing in your life. Hmm. You're in this place. 
The heart of the Israelite is one who is drawn to God by a heart of repentance. Yah says, when you cried your last tear, you wiped your eyes. Your tears are still before me. You're still crying. You're still bleeding. You're still hemorrhaging. You've been violated sexually. Y'all want healing. The truth in the animal parts. I want you to come. We're going to pray with you. We're going to touch and agree with you. Believe in Yah. Continue to heal your scars of your past. Don't be ashamed. Behold, I will do a new thing, said Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Consider not the former things, nor the things of old. Oh, I would do a new thing. Where are you be? You need to be up here. that either wasn't present or was present now, it imprisons you. 
Hallelujah. So it's not just about the intimacy in the natural. It is your intimacy with your father. Hallelujah. And right now what he's doing is creating the atmosphere that you can let go. Woo! He's reaching inside of brother whatever time in your life that it happened. Whether it was a child, whether it was an adolescent, whether it was a teenager and an adult. He's reaching to that individual. And he is saying it is okay to let go. Into me, I see you. Woo! I see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am there with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are not alone. Hallelujah. You are not just the victim. Hallelujah. I see you and I'm reaching into that person. And I'm calling you by your name. I'm not calling you by my habit. I'm calling you by your name. And I'm calling you blessed. I'm calling you my child. I am coming after you. I am running after you, says the Father. And I'm bringing healing. And I'm bringing restoration. And more importantly, I'm bringing identity. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
down. You said in your word that you seek your word to heal. And that all the weeks of that word, God, it comes healing and deliverance. So we thank you that right now, that not only is the spirit of restoration is here, but the spirit of healing and deliverance is here. The spirit of knowing who we are in you and through you. Our identity is being restored. Hallelujah. We are not just the victim, we are not the victim, but we are your chosen people that move in power and authority and identity. So I thank you right now. Then you're reaching into the hearts of brokenness. You're reaching into the hearts of every trauma that has happened. And we speak deliverance. We speak healing and authority through you. Hallelujah. As we cry out before you, you said that you take your tears and you bottle them. Hallelujah. And that you hasten your word to perform it. So thank you right now, Shah, that we're walking according to your law. And you're a commandment, and you're making everything new. He's got to make everything new. I'm making 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 everything new.
Hey, hey, hey.